Welcome to the Youth Ignite, South African and American Youth Dialogue on the Green Economy podcast, where you take through some of the most exciting green career journeys by true South Africans. We follow their highs and lows and follow their failures and triumphs, as well as tips and advice on how they got to where they are today, helping you prepare for your most meaningful career in the green economy. You will also get to explore American case studies and what we can learn from these to apply to our uniquely beautiful South Africa. Join us. Welcome to this episode of the Youth Ignite South African and American Youth Dialogue on the Green Economy. Today's speaker is Dr. Roderick Duba, postdoctoral researcher at the Water Research Commission. Welcome, Roderick, and thank you so much for being with us today. Morning, Jen. Thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. So, Roderick, tell us about who is Roderick? Where do you come from? What is your backstory? So the listeners can get to know you a bit. Yes, yeah, so I'm from, well, my name is Roderick Juba. I'm from a, a small town in the Eastern Cape called Humansdorp. Actually, I'm just from outside of Humansdorp, from an even smaller village there of about 50 people when I was growing up. It's called the Berg, which translates to the mountain. Um, went to school in Humansdorp, at Humansdorp Secondary, and before that, Kreisfontein Primary, and then um, made my way to Stellenbosch University uh, to, to further my studies over there. Um, yes, I'm from a family of uh, seven siblings, which is quite big, uh, we, of which I'm the last born. Which, so, which also means that I've had the opportunity to, to do what I want in, in going into the conservation space. Wow, sure. That's, that's interesting. You had a lot more freedom, I suppose, being the last born. Yes, I think so. <laughs> yeah. When people go ahead of you and they, they, they do study things that, that kind of can guarantee them jobs and things like that, and you get to go at the, at the end and kind of see um, what the options are for you. There's, no, there's not that much pressure on you as an individual to to actually you know fit that mold so I had a little bit of wiggle room to to really do what I want. Wow that's really great. I think you were you were very fortunate. So any last borns that may be something good to note. Yeah. So tell us a bit about your job. What does it entail? Um, your work at the research commission at uh, the Water Research Commission apologies. So my, my, my title is a postdoctoral researcher, and I've been, I've been, when I started, there's this project that we're doing called the Ecological Infrastructure for Water Security Project. It's funded by the Global Environment Facility through the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and it's in partnership with SANBI, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, and ourselves and a few other partners. Um, my work on that project is around social learning, knowledge management, and mediation. So a lot of it is, is talking to people, uh, sitting in workshops, giving inputs, but also telling stories, um, writing up case studies and, and papers around some of the work that we do in ecological infrastructure, which is, you know, looking at the, the ecosystems and ecosystem features that, that provide ecosystem services to us, specifically around water-related ecosystems. Um, yeah, so a lot of what I do is, is talking to people and, and telling those stories. But then there's another aspect to my job, which I'm really enjoying now, is, is project management. Um, so I've, I'm currently managing two projects of my own which is the first time in my career that I'm at, you know, at, the, at, at a place where I, I could actually manage projects, which I'm really enjoying as well. Your work sounds fascinating, um, Roderick. It's, uh, you know, I always say that water is more of a social issue in many cases, and it seems to come through in the work that you do, where you're looking at social learning and knowledge management and also working with partners with, the, uh, I'm sure, a wide range of stakeholders. Yes. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. So, so Jen, it's interesting that you note that because 
the in the past conservation and management of natural resources has almost been exclusionary you know so the idea was that to protect a certain piece of land you have to fence it off from people and now now we're starting to see that social systems are as part of the natural system as anything else so we need to incorporate those social systems in the management of those natural um, resources it's been you know it's been implemented at a small scale through the years but now it's really becoming part of the, of the practice itself which i think is really great we do a lot of our work down in KZN for instance where the um there's it's, it's a lot of rural land and the the land tenure and land ownership isn't the same as what you would get up in the western cape where you've got farms and you've got um government owned land and and those type of things in KZN it's a bit more um what do they call it communal lands so then the the dynamics are different and you have to incorporate all of those in in your planning and i think it's quite an exciting space to be it's very necessary as well yeah absolutely i i definitely agree with you and i love that you touched on that old that old school exclusionary model where people were kept completely separate fenced up the natural areas and you can't actually enjoy it and especially in south africa working with tribal communities, communal lands, many times those areas actually form an integral part of that society and that culture. Mm. So it's so encouraging to hear that that is actually becoming a norm now in the way that conservation is done and sustainable management of water. Yeah. So that, that's exciting. You, you're actually leading a field here. <laughs> I, you know, I only hope that it goes and, and it continues in the projects or the programs that happen in the future so that this doesn't get lost somewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that brings me to the next question. What do you love most about your job? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit of an ironic answer, if I can put it that way, because I... When I decided to get into the conservation field, my primary goal was to be outdoors uh, and away from people. And now, now that I'm in it, um, you know, working with people and then really figuring out these nuances and these complexities and talking to people, um, realizing that there's that, that much more to to conservation really that aspect of of just engaging for me is quite quite an enriching experience i get to learn so much more about people now than i thought i would ever do so i'm really enjoying that aspect of it oh thank you for sharing that's a very interesting transition that you made and i know a lot of scientists start out with the same intention they want to work somewhere where there are very few people involved They're out in the nature they focus on their science and then you start to realize that people really are integral to the system and uh, once you get into it it's actually a very enjoyable part of the work it is and and sorry the other thing is that you know a lot of times you look at at people or social systems as something that could get in the way of you completing a piece of work where it's now the other way around, where it really facilitates that process for you. And um, it makes it easier actually building these collaborative networks um, because we're not always on the ground. You go and you do a little bit of research and then you go out, but then, you know, someone still has to be the custodian of, of that area. Um, so really working with people and then realizing that and then using that as a strength for, for you know, for me, that that realization has made it much more enjoyable for me. That does make a lot of sense. Um, and I love that you use the word collaborative. It's um, very yes. You know, and especially uh, you, you've already alluded to that before, where you're working with uh, partners and stakeholders, social learning, all of these things, you have to have a collaborative nature. So what would you say the importance of developing your leadership skills is as a scientist in this space? Well, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, 
but you know it depends on what you as a scientist see as leadership skills so if we're talking about leadership skills in in a collaborative way where you lead but you lead within the you know within the groups you don't you don't stand somewhere and you you point out um this needs to be done and that's need to, and that needs to be done but you lead the process where people can give inputs and and you as 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 the leader then can can sift through that and make sense of all of it then that's absolutely critical if you the type of leader who has an idea and imposes that idea then it's probably not the kind of leader that you would want in this um in this field so leadership skills are very important but only if your definition of leadership falls within what's necessary um for that landscape i definitely agree with that and that i think that imposing type of leadership style actually lends itself more to the exclusionary conservation model yes whereas now it actually is almost leading from behind where you're yeah. encouraging people to participate and you're bringing everyone along yeah so that really. that sounds really exciting um and that i, I think is really very much the path that you're on with this work that you're doing so yeah. rodrick tell us about what have you had to do to get into this position maybe give us your academic journey and your working history until now so we mm-hmm. can sort of know what to expect to vaguely if anyone were to try and enter this space um i think i might have had one of the longer journeys but uh so i started my undergraduate at stellenbosch university back in 2009 i did uh undergrad in conservation ecology i did my masters also in conservation ecology um where i did some mine rehabilitation work and then started doing my phd but um my phd took me a full 6 years to do the first 3 years were full time and the, then i ran out of funding and i had to do um the last 3 years part time i was lucky to to get a job in the meantime um the the important things i would say that came you know that i did to to help me through was i i started working at the university during my second year during my first year actually at the end of my first year i started working there as a lab assistant as a field assistant and i was really trying to number one earn some money because while <clears throat> while I'm the last born and I had it easier than most I would I still needed money because I didn't have money for um tuition and I didn't have that much money for for pocket money either so I worked on campus I made a lot of uh friends that way uh, build a strong network early on which I think really helped me people were giving me advice uh I also met my master's and PhD supervisor early on so we were able to to build a really strong relationship from the beginning already so by the time I got to masters he had a project for me um we had that understanding finished that in 2 years and then on to the PhD again we had I still had the same supervisors so having that consistency and continuity really helped me um and then also going while in my first year of phd we me and some of the the students or ex ex classmates that i had we we started a project together with a conservation leadership program we applied for funding for that and and we actually got the funding and then we started doing doing the project and from that as a student you know you don't always think past just your studies but i think that for me was a really important move because again i was able to network further and then i started talking to people in the industry and understanding what the challenges are um how you supposed to um go about implementing a project so going through all the stakeholder engagements um project planning processes budgeting and all those type of things so to get through all of that and then uh starting a job at living lands after or during my phd all of that actually was stepping stones to get to that job um through all the networks that are built and through all the the knowledge that I've generated in that time and now I'm here oh that's that's exciting and and you're here at a fairly 
early point in your career, um, even considering the long journey you've been on. So really well done for that. And I think the success that you've, you've experienced so far is exactly as a result of you thinking past your studies. I think that's a very important practice that uh, people should get into early on. Um, and I remember, you know, we go way back, and I remember you working on, the, I think it was Pop and Kale's yes, weekend um, project. Yes. And that was really during your studies, you're already getting involved in some project work, understanding the complexities of the kind of work that you do. Um, without it only being theoretical by the time you left university? Definitely. I mean, that, that project, Jen, was a, was a year-long project, and it was, I think we got $12,500 of funding for that. Wow. Which wow. Was small. wow. But for that, students. That's amazing. Yeah, for students. It, <laughs> it, was, it was really great to do that and to, you know, to, to really hone in on your skills on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that project really helped me a lot. Yeah, 100%. And it, it gave you insight into things that you may not have known from just studying in a book. Mm, mm. Um, so exactly. I think that really brings me to my next question. If you were to recommend a book for someone really wanting to thrive in this space, what would that book be? Um, Jen, I would say any book on on systems theory. So I've I've gone through what I think is a really easy easy read. It's Donella Meadows. It's called a primer, uh, but thinking in systems a primer, and it really just goes through the whole thing step by step and and draws the reader's attention to you know to how systems actually work and realizing that everything you do is not in isolation. Everything you do is, is within a system of, you know, either a subsystem or a system of something else. And for me, that's a critical thing if we, if we in this, in this um, space or in this sector, everything, what we were talking about earlier with the, with the fencing off of areas for conservation, you're basically taking that piece of land out of the system and the people away from the land. So you're splitting things. But if we if we look at these things as systems and you understand that these are complex systems that need complex interactions and complex um, uh, thinking, then it becomes that much, it becomes second nature to you and it becomes easier. It becomes a lot more beneficial to, to all the stakeholders and all the different moving parts, including uh, that natural system that you're trying to protect. Well, that's an interesting recommendation. Thank you. Um, you know, usually people have a recommendation based on the career, but I love that you help to shift a mindset with that book. So I will definitely put that link in the text uh, for people to look for. Awesome. So do you think that there's any room for more people to do what you're doing in South Africa and even in the US? Yes, this would be the short answer. Um, what, what I'm doing, if, if, if we're talking about doing the, the work from a social learning perspective and then implementing like that, then yes, there's a lot of scope for that. And there's a lot of scope for especially in South Africa for people of color or for black people, because what we see right now is there's a language barrier oftentimes when we, when we visit these um, rural communities, because a lot of people who are um, in the field are Afrikaans or English. So, you know, there's, there's this big push to get young people into the system. Um, but then those people need to be skilled and those people need to be, they need to really be involved in the whole project. So I think there's really big scope to bring more people in and especially people who, who are able to speak the, the language or the native languages of South Africa. And I guess in the U S also there's different areas and different landscapes um, with the, with the native Americans, for instance, where you might need, you, you might need a little bit of that cultural background and a little bit of language background to interact more holistically with those people. 
I find that a very interesting concept that especially now, as we go further into this more of a, I would call it a peace parks model where there's that more inclusionary system, mm. you are going to need more people who understand a local context. So thank you. That's, that's really brilliant advice. So people need to look for their unique strengths and use that to their advantage. Exactly. I like that you put it that way because that's exactly what it is. I think a lot of people see it as a job opportunity, but I think they miss the importance that they could play, the important role that they could play in it. Yeah, absolutely. They they really could unlock. I've, I've heard so many stories about conservation projects where the local communities were not involved at all, weren't mm. consulted, and only yeah. the the farmers, the white farmers were consulted. And mm. you definitely get the skewed in benefits and the, yeah. the, the, the outcomes are never what they should be. And they never really are very sustainable in that case. But if you're able exactly. to bring in the right kind of people that can connect with the, the people who are living there for many generations, not just the farmers, you actually can really have a holistic approach. I totally agree with that. I, I mean, no, thank you. Take, sorry, just before we finish that, if you take myself, for instance, my background is Afrikaans. Right. And the type of work I'm doing now is in the case of in rural landscape where, where the, the main language is Zulu, but it's not just Zulu. It's like a really deep Zulu that I can't even pick up with my limited knowledge of Zulu. So um, we need we really need people who, who have that background, who can seamlessly engage in, in those landscapes with and, and, and bring bring across the, the message that we're trying to give, but also the message that those communities are trying to give back to us. So like you say, that sustainability aspect comes through that understanding of, of each other. Yeah, absolutely. That shared learning experience, we mm. go together. Yeah. Um, very lovely. Thank you. That's, that's excellent advice. And maybe if you have a specific advice you want to give to people, like, Let's say I'm, I'm a young graduate or I'm very early on in my career in conservation in any field and I've decided I'd like to pursue a career in the water sector. What would you advise them? I would, first of all, I would, I would say network as much as you can and also network without expectation. Um, you know, people can... can <laughs> I almost want to say people can see when you're desperate for something. I think if you network without expectation, just with with a, with a pure interest in, in what people are doing, you ask people, what are you busy with? How does that fit into this landscape? Just doing all that and getting a lot of background information so you can also be part of conversations, that really helps. Um, putting yourself into those situations where you can network is then another one. And, for me, doing, doing that conservation leadership program project on the Papenkale's wetland, that put me in a situation where I had to network. My um, funding program through Green Matter also put me in situations where I needed to engage with people, network, and, and up until this day, I still have access to that network, Jen. I'm, I'm still talking to you. I had a mentor during my Green Matter days um, who I'm still talking to. So really just engaging with people, not expecting anything, but knowing that because we are a, um, a social um, species almost, you know, we need to, be, to keep in touch with people and we need support from people, but sometimes other people need support from us also and you need to lend yourself to that. So it goes two ways. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And I like that you say without expectation, it's really about almost building a friendship over time yes. uh, and the thing you have in common is your vision and the purpose that you want to bring to the world in your career. Yes. And yeah. I always tell people if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. So definitely networking. I, I really appreciate that you've brought that up because um, mm. especially in a sector as small as this, 
Um, if you're known, people will first of all get to know you and get to like you and then want to work with you and, and start to trust in your abilities. Mm. And you also and get... I, I've, seen you, I've seen you doing that really well over the years as well. And I think there are a lot of people that can learn from you in that regard. Listen, it takes effort. It's a real effort to, to yeah. do that. My wife once asked me, like, how do you, how do, you do it? It's easy. Like you have to put yourself in a space where you, okay, I'm willing to go out to this event and, and just talk to people, or I'm willing, I'm just going to go do this field visit with, with this organization and see what, what's happening there. And then putting yourself in a space where you're ready to have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And you never know. Ten years down the line, that person you met at that event may say, we really need someone, and I remembered you from that event. Exactly. And then you have a better opportunity to actually make the impact that you want. Yeah. But yeah. definitely. Great. Thank you. Those are, those are amazing insights, and this has been such an interesting journey through your history and through your experiences and, and your knowledge. Um, I think my, my final two questions I want to cover a little bit about South Africa and the US and really talk to, you know, our experience in South Africa with day zero in Cape Town in between 2016 and 2018. And, mm. you know, in America, there, there tend to be a lot of desert areas and they have similar approaches to, or, or similar experiences, sorry, about their, their zero water there are some great examples of water purification technology and there are some places where America has succeeded in dealing with that kind of environment. What would you say Cape Town could learn from the US uh, in, in that regard? Um, Jen, I think, I think Cape Town is in a really good place right now where they are able to to implement things in advance and not and not in response to, you know, looking at some of the things that's been happening in the U.S. with the with the um, water purifications and using recycled purified water to make beer and all those things, it's great that you can if you can put those things in place before you get to the next drought because we know it's going to happen again. We were talking about it's a once in a hundred year event, but I think it's happened twice or three times in the last hundred years. So it's going to happen again and it's going to happen again. So what Cape Town and what actually the rest of South Africa needs to implement better, I think, is how do we in improve our planning way ahead of, of, of the time when we actually need it? We're seeing a, a little bit of difficulty in the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan at the moment. Um, some of the stuff that the Water Research Commission, for instance, is busy with is this national siltation program or dam siltation program where we're looking at how does silt end up in dams and reduce the capacity of those dams. Can we stop silt from entering the dams in the, those levels? And we're looking at then ecological infrastructure, which is what I was talking about earlier. It's, it's having those ecosystems intact so that your, your dams don't silt up um, prematurely. We were talking about desalination um, around Cape Town a few years ago. And I think they're also going to, yeah, that's also going to be a long-term solution for them. But it's really putting those things in place way before you actually need them. Cape Town is in a really good position to do that, especially with those extra water levies that they that they put on during the drought. And I don't think they, they took that off yet. So they can use that leverage now to, to prepare them for the next one. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, there's definitely something to be learned from past experience. Mm. So maybe my last question uh, is, is really about trying to find places where South Africa can also celebrate its wins in terms of sustainable water management and like the kind of work you do, working with communities, ensuring that people have access, have um, ownership and influence over the process when it comes to water? Yeah. 
It's a, it's a really interesting question. So, like I said, we are working on on this national dam siltation program at the moment, where um, we're really trying to make sure that water security isn't influenced by things that we can already um, address at this point. Um, that is going to, you know, we're working on the strategy for that, and it's going to be rolled out nationally. But in terms of things like the ecological infrastructure for water security project, we've now learned that water security isn't just the water that's in the dams. You know, it's it's this whole system around it. Again, it's got it's, we're dealing with invasive alien plants, which um, the government has implemented a, the Working for Water program, for instance, since '95, I think, um, and that's been going on for the since then and it's it's a it's a big project in terms of removing invasive alien trees from riparian zones because they they use up a lot of water but it also works in in job creation and making sure that um we don't our unemployment rates um come down a little bit which i think is a brilliant initiative and to also to be able to keep it going for that long is is, is quite is, is is quite something special um yeah and getting getting buy-in from from people like farmers from from the actual land custodians where people are actually now going out and they understand the 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 context of of water coming from catchment areas and ending up in dams and where we can use it it's not water that just comes out of a tap and and it's just there i think we've done really well in in terms of communicating um that aspect of water management to people. And then also from, from a purely science perspective, we have now switched from uh, like what we were talking about earlier, having information and giving it to people, but rather learning and having that co-learning practice around this whole thing so that it's not just a, a practice of inf information going one direction, but actually going both directions. So we, all of us understand the systems better now. The work that we're doing in KZN is a great example of this, where people really rely on springs over there for, for nice natural mountain water, clean water. And now we're looking at, you know, like how far communities are from these springs, what their um, reliance is on the springs and how we can ensure that in those systems, water security is maintained in the long term. Um, so we've definitely gone a long way in terms of making sure people have access to clean water. Uh, we, could, we could definitely do a lot more, but I mean, we've, we've had some really big wins. And I think the Working for Water program, um, as much flack as it gets, it's, you know, it's a really good initiative, especially um, with job creation, but also with the amount of trees that get removed out of riparian zones. Uh, if you see the numbers of, of how much water these trees actually take up, that's a, that's a really big pro program to kind of, um, lesson that. Great, thank you. I, I do agree with you. I think, you know, people don't really realize that South Africa is actually a very dry country. Mm. So we need all the help we can to conserve water. And uh, I think working for water has done an excellent job at a national scale. Yeah. To try to do that. Um, so, yeah, I, I love what you're saying. I think there's, there's an element of stewardship that is involved from what I'm hearing. Uh, mm. There's a longer-term view to solving these problems, and they're tackling the complexity of it and trying to get the community involved. So I see that as quite a unique and maybe a cutting-edge approach to water management for South Africa. Yes, and it's it's one of those that there aren't that many international examples that you can pull from. So it's really that innovation that came through from South Africans, um, you know, to, to, to try and manage these challenges. I just want to add that the way Cape Town did the, the day zero thing when, when the taps were about to run dry, I don't think we've ever seen a campaign like that where, you know, where it had that much backing to, to make sure that people went from, what was that? 200 liters of water a day to 50 liters of water a day. That's something that that we can look at in, in, in retrospect and go, well, you know, if you can put in that much effort and that much um, awareness making into, into that, um, 
I guess, into your communication, then you could potentially use those same networks or those same um, channels to continue um, creating awareness around water. People really responded to that. And that's why we didn't end up with, with dry taps at the end of the day, because um, the, the community at large got behind the, uh, that program. That's, that's really great. And it's actually, it's almost, we're now just dealing with social innovation when it comes to water in South Africa. And because we have such diverse cultures, I think it lends us to being very innovative in a social context and actually leaders globally in that, con in that context. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Thank you. So, Roderick, I think before we go, I want to just give you an opportunity to say anything else that you feel is important for, for anyone to know or anything you feel that you have on your heart to share. <laughs> uh, that's a difficult one, Jen. Um, I think I've said most of what I, what I would have liked to say. But uh, I think... We, as, as young people getting into this space, we always, or a lot of the time, you've, you have that imposter syndrome and you feel like you don't fit in. That's a big challenge to overcome, especially now during, during lockdown. One, one thing that I've uh, experienced is the difficulty of adapting and adjusting to new environments because a lot of what we're doing is online. So you don't get to really pick up on people's personalities. You don't get to to really connect with people in the way we're used to. So there's that little feeling of, of isolation. And, you know, we're talking about networking a lot, but you can't really network in isolation like that. It's, 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 it's a lot more difficult. And that then leads to, and it, or it, um, it assists or it creates this feeling of, of, um, of that imposter syndrome where you, where you really feel like maybe you're not fitting in or you don't have that much to offer. But at the end of the day, I mean, we are, what I was saying earlier is we've got so much to offer, especially as young people coming into the system. And then you just have to find what it is that you can offer to the system and really work on that. I'm talking about networking a lot because it's so important, but then finding out exactly where in the system you can fit yourself in using your skill sets and your, your background, your your cultural history, anything that is unique to you, how you can apply that in the system to, to, to make it slightly better. You don't have to change the world. You just have to make it slightly better. Great advice. Thank you. Um, I, I think we all suffer from imposter syndrome. And all of us, I think, I think it's universal that all of us have had to deal with that, that feeling. So thank you for that. And uh, it's, it's good to just remind people that it's okay. You just have to face those demons, I suppose, and work through it. Yes. Oh, great. Fantastic. And, um, Roderick, I want to say thank you so much for your insights today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I myself have learned a lot. I was very excited to also hear about everything that you are doing in your career because we do go we do go way back and it's been such a pleasure watching you grow and flourish and, and find this niche that you're in and I really do think that you're going to make a very big impact in South Africa and globally so I wish you all the best. Thank you Jen as soon as I get over my imposter syndrome. Please do, please do. I think uh, <laughs> there's no need for that. Definitely not. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having me, Jen. It was really nice talking to you. Thank and you. Thank you so much. For what you guys are doing. You too, and stay well. Thank you for listening to this episode funded by the U.S. Embassy and in partnership with the Youth Bridge Trust. For more information on the Green Economy Academy and South African and American Youth Dialogue on the Green Economy, visit the Youth Bridge Trust on www.youthbridgetrust.org.
We would like to thank our sponsors, the U.S. Embassy, for making these episodes possible. Remember to tune in for our next episode.